Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 29 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Lee Cowden, and the topic is effective treatment of Lyme disease. Dr. Lee Cowden is a U.S. board-certified cardiologist and internist who is internationally known for his knowledge and skill in practicing and teaching integrative medicine. He is a clinical nutritionist and a respected expert in kinesiology and various forms of energetic testing. He has co-authored many books and articles on integrative medicine and has pioneered successful treatments of cancer, autism, Lyme disease, and many other illnesses. He serves as the chairman of the Scientific Advisory Board and Academy Professor for the Academy of Comprehensive Integrative Medicine. He is the creator of the well-known Cowden Support Protocol. And now, my interview with Dr. Lee Cowden. I have been fortunate to know Dr. Lee Cowden for over a decade, which is hard to believe, and he's been one of my mentors over the years. He's done so much for those of us that have been impacted with Lyme disease and other chronic illnesses, and it's an honor for me to have him on the show today. Welcome, Dr. Cowden. Thank you for having me on the show today, Scott. Absolutely. So many practitioners with a focus on Lyme disease have had some personal experience that drew them into the world of Lyme. How did you get involved in Lyme disease for as long as you have been? And did you ever have a personal experience with Lyme disease yourself? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> the, the first uh, interaction with Lyme disease was with the son, grandson of a naturopathic friend of mine, uh, the, the boy had been an A student, an avid athlete, and uh, contracted Lyme and went down to uh, not even be able to get out of bed and, and uh, was making F's in class because his, his brain wouldn't work. And uh, she had taken him to an allopathic doctor. He started on pharmaceutical antibiotics of several types, and he just got progressively worse. So uh, so she and I intervened and put him on a natural treatment program, and he uh, was pretty much completely well in two months. And... Uh, so she took him back to the allopathic doctor and said, uh, I'm pretty sure these herbs got him well. And the doctor said, no, it's not possible. There's nothing as strong as the antibiotics I was giving him. She said, no, I'm pretty sure it was the herbs. And he said, well, I'll prove it to you. I'll, I'll send you some uh, patients that are failing antibiotic therapy. You put them on your stupid herb and see that it doesn't work. And uh, so he sent her 58 patients. And, uh, and, and there was at least a, a 30% improvement in every patient in the 58 patients in, in three months' time. Some of them were 60% approved. So, uh, so she uh, got excited, called me and said, we need to do a study. I said, I don't have time to do a study. She said, no, you just have to show up. I'll do the study. I said, I, I can show up. <laughs> so we did that study in Dallas in, uh, in 2003. And uh, we had you know, 28 patients, 14 pairs of patients. And uh, half of them went into our treatment group. The other half stayed uh, under the care of the allopathic doctor doing the best that he knew how to treat them. At uh, 10 weeks, we had a 70% improvement in, uh, of all the symptoms in our group, and uh, he had minimal improvement in his group. And by the 18th week, we had a closer to 90% improvement in our treatment group. So we knew for, for a fact that with enough natural therapies all combined that we could make a difference. Wow. That's amazing. And then you mentioned it sounded like you had also had some experience personally with Lyme disease as part of your own health history. Yeah, uh, not too long after that, I, I started having night sweats, and I thought, I think that might be Babesia. And so I tested uh, positive for Babesia and Borrelia, and so I decided to take my own medicine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's nice. So what role does Lyme disease, in your opinion, play in various neurological diseases? I mean, we see all kinds of things uh, around multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's and ALS and whatnot. If someone has a diagnosis of one of those conditions, do you think it would behoove them to get tested for Lyme? And does that potentially play a significant role in those conditions? Uh, I think it plays a huge role in most of those conditions, and, and dementia as well. You know, Judith McClossie in uh, Switzerland found that 25% uh, of the patients that uh, she did autopsies on that died with dementia had uh, spir had uh, Borrelia in their brain, and 65% had uh, treponema spirochetes in their brain. 
So it looked like uh, you know, the spirochetes were a huge factor in uh, dementia based on uh, based on her research. Uh, Dr. Lita Matman uh, did a uh, culture of uh, 41 consecutive uh, cerebral spinal fluids from MS patients. And she found uh, Borrelia grew out of uh, 38 of those. Yeah, so it's 93%, pretty, pretty high probability that a person has uh, a Lyme disease if they have MS. Uh, I've seen, seen a lot of patients with Parkinson's over the years that, uh, that we just treated their Lyme disease completely and the Parkinson's went away. ALS is a tough one, uh, but it's not always uh, uh, impossible. Uh, but, but a lot of those folks do have uh, bur- you know, Borrelia and other co-infections. And if you treat the Borrelia and co-infections, then they do get better. And would you say that autism is also potentially a condition where exploring Lyme disease, whether Lyme disease is the cause or not, probably is another discussion, but do you think that, that Lyme should be explored in children that are on the spectrum? Absolutely. I don't think uh, Lyme disease is usually the primary cause of, of, of autism, but I have seen uh, at least one little girl, I remember, that uh, was uh, we treat. We did all the other things that we needed to do for for uh, for autism. When we checked her for for Lyme disease, we found uh, Borrelia and uh, Babesia. So we treated her for those two, and by the uh, I think it's two month two months of treatment, she was uh, you know speaking and, and uh, having eye t- eye contact and all kinds of other things that we you know we attributed completely to the treatment. So we know that Lyme disease historically has been termed a tick-borne illness, but I'm interested in your thoughts on uh, what are some of the methods through which people get exposed to Borrelia and Lyme-related co-infections? Is it beyond ticks? Is it beyond insects? Uh, yes, uh, not just ticks, but a variety of other uh, biting insects can uh, transmit the condition. That would include uh, fleas and flies and lice and mites and scabies and so on. Uh, but, you know, there's, uh, there's live Borrelia found in the semen of, of uh, sperm, uh, men, yeah, along with the sperm of men. And uh, there's also live Borrelia culturable from the vaginal secretions of women. So it's almost certainly transmitted sexually as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, found in blood transfusions, uh, you know, blood blanked, banked blood. So it's very, very likely transmitted by blood transfusions. Uh, even though the allopathic medical community says it's not possible, but I think they just don't want to screen the blood, all the blood in the country for uh, for Borrelia. Uh, there's, uh, there's, you know, the Borrelia has been found in the mother's breast milk and uh, unpasteurized milk of, of various animals, uh, goats and sheep and uh, cows and so on. So I think there's a variety of ways that we can contract uh, Borrelia and uh, co-infections, not just uh, tick bites. So you mentioned unpasteurized milk, and I hear people debate the topic of raw milk all the time, but does that potentially mean that raw milk could be a source of exposure to Borrelia? Unfortunately, yes. I, I like the concept of raw milk uh, you know, for other reasons, but uh, and, I, and I was raised on raw milk out on the ranch in West Texas, and I survived that, but, uh, but that was a, a pastured cow, you know, not one that was fed uh, grains in the feedlot and, and stressed from from all the uh, things that the animals are stressed from and, and a close, you know, close encounter with other animals. So uh, you know, it's usually better you, if you're going to do, uh, you know, pa- uh, pa- unpasteurized milk of any type, make sure it's a, a, a range-free animal. And, and, I'm, and I'm guessing the thought is similar to humans, that if their environment and their emotional state and all of those other things are more stressed, that they're more likely to manifest microbial overgrowth. Is that kind of the thought process there? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, they have better health if they're not crowded, not stressed. Makes sense. So in all the years that you focused on Lyme disease, which now sounds like it's at least uh, 14 or more since you started some of the initial studies, um, what are some of the things that have excited you and that have emerged as some of the better treatment options? And in 2017, what are the things that you think are potentially the most helpful for dealing with Lyme disease? Well, I would say this, that if a patient contracts Lyme disease and they, they see a tick on the body and they get a bullseye rash, that, uh, that it is reasonable probably to do a pharmaceutical antibiotic because that's still considered the standard of care. But, but if, they, if they don't have a, tick, a known tick bite, they don't have a bullseye rash and they're getting just chronically ill, and they've been chronically ill for months or years, 
uh, my experience is that the antibiotics don't work as well in that case. Uh, the, 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 the bugs are too entrenched. And uh, you know, the Borrelia lives in several different forms. And it's, uh, we, we now know from research that Eva Sapi did that, that at least doxycycline, which is the most commonly prescribed uh, antibiotic, is not uh, effective against the, the cyst form or the granular form, nor the, uh, the biofilm form. So it's, it's kind of crazy to think that you can eliminate the, the Borrelia from the body uh, by just giving doxycycline. In that same study, she did find that several of the herbs that, that I commonly use for Lyme disease are effective against the biofilm form and against the spirochetal form and against the granular form. Uh, so, you know, that, that's why I prefer those uh, as treatment. And I think the other thing that I've learned over the uh, last 13 years is that uh, cyclical therapy, in my opinion, is absolutely essential because these bugs come out of hiding when you stop the therapy. You know, when you come out, when you stop the therapy, then you can restart the therapy and kill off some of the, some of the spirochetes, which are the most vulnerable to treatment, but, and also the most invasive forms. But if, you, if you're giving antibiotics continuously, or, or even herbals continuously, the, the bugs just stay in the hiding forms inside the cells or, or inside the biofilm, and they're really hard to treat. So a couple of things there. So <clears throat> cyclotherapy, as I understand it, is you do the antimicrobials, you take a break that lets the microbes come back out, and then you start again. And if I remember right, in the um, <clears throat> Cowden support protocol, that's where you do something like 12 and a half days of antimicrobials, and there's at least a 36-hour break. Is that part of the implementation of the cyclotherapy in the Cowden protocol? Exactly. And, uh, you know, between 2003, when we did the pilot study in Dallas on Lyme disease, and then 2007, when Dr. Horowitz uh, asked for uh, a copy of that to use on his patients, uh, I did some testing to find out what was the optimum length of time to be off and on. And I found that five, five days was too short a time to be on. And I found that uh, it wasn't necessary to be off uh, or, or to, to be on longer than the 12 or 12 and a half days. So that's why we stuck with it, you know, 12, 12 to 12 and a half. And then I determined how long do you have to be off in order for the hiding forms to come out of hiding. And it was uh, thir 36 hours was the minimal time. 48 hours was the maximum time because if you went beyond 48 hours, there were so many bugs that, were, that have come out of hiding that you got a massive Herxheim reaction when you restarted treatment and the patients uh, could, couldn't tolerate that. So the, that's how we came up with the 12 and a half days on and three and a half and one and a half day off or 36 hours off, 36 Perfect. hours from one, from, from one dose till the next dose. So let's go back and talk a little bit about the work that Eva Shapi had done that you uh, mentioned. I, if I remember correctly, one of her earlier studies was that the combination of Nutramedics, Cemento, and Banderol was a very good combination for dealing with Lyme and biofilms. And then I believe one of her later studies was that Nutramedics, Stevia, was also, if I remember correctly, was as effective as a triple antibiotic combination therapy in her study. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, you know, that, that earlier study, uh, she compared uh, doxycycline in vitro to cemento alone in vitro and banderol alone in vitro and the combination of banderol and cemento together in vitro. And what she found is that the, uh, the doxycycline would not pen penetrate the biofilm, and the, the microbes were still alive inside the biofilm according to staining procedures. But uh, when you gave Banderol alone, the biofilm was still there, but almost all the bugs were dead, you know, changed to orange color inside the biofilm by staining. And uh, when you gave Cemento alone, the biofilm was pretty much gone, but there were still some live bugs. When you gave the combination of Banderol and Cemento together, the biofilm was all gone and the bugs were all dead. And so that uh, appeared to be the best combination. So that's why the first uh, 78 days of the Cal Support Program has Banderol and Cemento uh, as, as a primary treatment. Later, we sent uh, other herbs up to Dr. Sapi to, to test and found she found that, uh, that most of them have a, a good uh, anti-Borrelia effect. You know, the, uh, the Anula has in it uh, Halapa, and Halapa is a herb from Central America that's been used for a long time for treatment of parasites. But it was one of the more, one of the more effective anti-Borrelia treatments uh, that, she, that she tested. And, and then the stevia uh, 
uh, from Nutramax was also very effective. And in that same study, she tested uh, other stevias from other country companies and didn't find the same effect. And uh, I think it has to do with uh, you know, several factors, you know, whether the stevia is organic, which the Nutramax stevia uh, is tested uh, to be free of pesticides, uh, whether the uh, what, you know, what kind of extraction process is used? Because when you use certain extraction processes, you lose the some of the some of the most beneficial antimicrobial agents in the in the extraction process, and the process that Nutramax uses conserves those uh, antimicrobial agents, unlike some of the other stevias on the market. Is there also uh, an energetic aspect to the Nutramedic Stevia product like there are to some of the other products that Nutramedics has where they've been informationally enhanced in some way or no? No, they haven't uh, done that to the, to the Nutramedic Stevia uh, because it's given simultaneous with other products that are quantum physically imprinted or, or uh, energetically enhanced with right. homeopathic-like energies. And so it's really not necessary to do it also since it's given at the same time. Perfect. So in, in Lyme disease, we think about microbial overgrowths, we think about toxicity. How is approaching the treatment of Lyme disease different from approaching the treatment of autism? And are there some pearls around the treatment of autism that you can share with our listeners? Okay. Well, yeah, the, the, uh, the treatment of, uh, of Lyme disease, I've, I've learned, has to be consistent and persistent. <laughs> You know, some people do a little of this, a little of that, and expect to get well, and they don't get well. Now, the uh, one, you know, the bigger factors I found in treating uh, patients with Lyme disease is, is almost all of them that are chronically ill have other factors that are contributing to the illness that they don't recognize and that they're not addressing. Uh, especially with some of the other treatment programs that are out there, you know, if you just give doxycycline, you're not addressing the, you know, the nutrient deficiencies or the toxicity or a lot, or a lot of the other factors. You know, with the uh, herbal program that I put together, you know, we're addressing the uh, heavy metal toxicity, the sulfa antibiotic, sulfa diuretic, sulfa uh, diabetic drug uh, toxicities that are poisoning the, the sulfation pathway and blocking formation of glutathione. We're addressing the, the, the accumulation of biotoxins in the tissues with the, with the berber and with the panella and with the parsley and, and sometimes even with the mapalo. And so these are, these are uh, necessary to get these biotoxins and heavy metals and radioactive elements and, and uh, sulfur drugs out of the body if you're going to get a patient well because it's, so, it's that environment that is perfect for the bugs to grow and hard for the immune system to be functional. So if you get the toxins out, the immune system works better and the bugs uh, don't thrive and then they can be killed off. And then tying the treatment of Lyme to autism, how, how is approaching treatment of autism different? Well, yeah, autism has so many other factors. You know, uh, when, when we treat patients with uh, autism, we use uh, a variety of other methodologies. Uh, you know, so uh, we, we found that uh, in getting rid of the uh, the metal is still important, but uh, but also getting rid of the vaccine residuals is absolutely essential in uh, in getting rid in getting a child with autism uh, back to back to baseline. Almost all the children with autism have a, a fire on a brain on fire uh, by by interject testing. They have a gut on fire by interject testing. And if you don't do something to address that that fire uh, figuratively, then you can't get the get the child well. Well, the fire is coming from a combination of microbes and toxins, not just uh, microbes alone. And uh, so, if you don't detoxify at the same time you're, you're getting rid of the bugs uh, on a child with autism. You know, you don't get them well because the the, the fire persists. The, the toxins create an environment to regrow the bugs, and you're just continually chasing the bugs. Now, you know, there's there's a lot of other factors with autism. You know, uh, you know there there are uh, the, the subconscious emotional factors. For example, we know that that a, 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 an attorney or a doctor is more likely to have a child with autism than somebody that's not a doctor or an attorney. And the interesting thing about those two professions is that they're both sworn to secrecy about their clients, their patients. And uh, so there's, there's this uh, need of the, of the, of the uh, parent of the child with autism to not speak certain things, to, to hold, hold in secrecy. And so when you resolve that conflict, uh, then oftentimes the kids start, the next morning start, start speaking. So we've, we've done the emotional work on the parent. And then have the parent go to the child's bedside at, at, at night 
just after they fall asleep and tell them the story. You know, uh, you know, I didn't realize you know, that my profession in holding in secrets was having possibly having an effect on you. So today, I did emotional work on that, resolved that conflict, and I'm no longer going to hold on to that emotional conflict, nor, my dear child, do I want you to either. The next day, they wake up speaking. So wow. it's pretty, pretty amazing. <laughs> that is pretty amazing. So when you mentioned brain on fire, uh, gut on fire, one of the things in autism that I think about is the inflammatory process. And so is there something either as part of your Cowden support protocol and the Nutramedics products or other tools that you use to help reduce the inflammation? And, and one of the things that I often think about is that sometimes reducing the inflammation is also an important aspect of allowing the tissues to release toxicity. And I'm wondering if you would agree with that as well. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. The toxic tissues don't release, uh, uh, the infl inflamed tissues don't release toxins very well at all. But uh, you know the uh, this uh, phenomena of, of brain brain on fire, gut on fire uh, is uh, you know addressed by the herbs that are in the uh, in the her you know the herbal cow support program because they were tested at the University of Guayaquil in Ecuador in, a, in an animal model. And they tested it against feldine, which is uh, strong, one of the strongest uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that was ever on the U.S. market. It's so strong that it's been removed from the U.S. market. Uh, but uh, it, it, it was found to have a 99.8% reduction in inflammation in the animal model. And the, the Nutramax Noni was found to have a 99.4% reduction in the inflammation uh, in that same model. Uh, whereas the Mirinda Noni was found to have a 33% reduction in inflammation. Now, the only difference between the Mirinda Noni and the Nutramedics Noni is the quantum physical imprints. So, so a lot of a lot of the inflammation reducing effect is coming from the imprints that the Nutramax products have. But in that same model, the uh, Cemento reduced the inflammation 84%. The uh, I think the Kina and the Commanda both reduced it about 90, 96 or 98%. So they were all quite effective anti-inflammatories. Now, the other thing I get uh, parents to do that have children with autism as much as they can is, is ground that kid to the earth and reduce the amount of electro, uh, electronics and electromagnetic devices that they get exposed to because the, the electromagnetic devices are actually increasing the inflammation, not decreasing it, especially in the brain. Because when you when you're around electromagnetic uh, influences, that disrupts the blood the blood brain barrier, and when it disrupts the blood brain barrier, then you end up getting a uh, a uh, a leaky brain, basically. So the toxins in the in the brain go into the uh, or toxins in the blood go into the brain and create that uh, environment that's perfect to, to regrow the bugs. Perfect. Yeah, that's very helpful. So I know your background is in cardiology, and, and we hear some about uh, cardiac issues in Lyme disease. It's not, not something that I commonly hear discussed, but I'm interested in maybe a couple of comments on how commonly do people with Lyme experience uh, cardiac symptoms, and then do those generally resolve with treatment with something like the Cowden Support Protocol? Okay, well, the long answer you can get by reading the chapter that I contributed to Dr. Sinatra's book, uh, uh, and uh, that's, uh, I forget the name of the, the title of the book, but uh, he did it with Dr. Mark Houston. And uh, so I, I have a whole chapter in there about that topic. But the, uh, the bottom line is that uh, it's not a very common problem in patients uh, with Lyme disease in general. Uh, and in my experience, it's more common in patients that have unresolved emotional heart issues. And what happens is the unresolved emotional heart issues, whether that's broken heartedness, hard heartedness, or love block, will cause physical toxin accumulation in the heart, which creates the environment in the heart, which makes it easy for the bugs to grow in the heart. And so then you end up with the inflammation coming from the bugs and the toxins that are there, causing arrhythmias, congestive heart failure, cardiomyopathy, uh, and other problems. Okay, that's very helpful. So from your perspective, let's talk about Herxheimer reactions. Are they, to you, a sign that treatment is working, or are they a sign that treatment is either too aggressive or that detoxification is not being adequately supported? And when people have these strong Herxheimer reactions that are severe, persistent, and recurrent, either with antibiotics or with herbs, what are some of the things that you find helpful um, to reduce those reactions? Well, I don't like the patients to have severe and protracted Herxheimer reactions. I think that's counterproductive. And uh, a lot of uh, allopathic doctors, when they give a patient antibiotic for Lyme disease, 
uh, the, when the patient gets the Herxheimer reaction, they just say, well, stop the drug and, and uh, you know, wait it out. See, you know, when, it fi- when the Herxheimer reaction finally stops, which is usually a few days later, then restart the drug. Well, because during the days that they were off the, uh, the drug, the, the bugs regrow, they get another Herx reaction as soon as they restart the drug, so they never get anywhere. And, uh, or otherwise, they're just continually suffering from the Herx reaction. I don't think that's appropriate because I found that there's a variety of remedies that you can use along with the pharmaceutical antimicrobials or the herbal antimicrobials to get really good results uh, with the Herx reaction. Uh, for example, the Nutramax, uh, Berber, and Pinella together, taken every 15 minutes, will usually resolve the Herx reaction in less than two hours. Uh, just, just those two remedies by themselves. Uh, you put them in about two ounces of water every dose and uh, drink it down. The water helps to flush the toxins away from the tissues and, and you know, clear the toxins through the through the kidneys and, and through the liver and all there in the bowel. And uh, you know, the, if that doesn't work, then I usually use uh, liposomal glutathione topically. I prefer topically because uh, so often the patients are allergic to the lecithin that the glutathione is. Uh, liposomal glutathione is made from, and so if they rub it on the skin, they get a pretty good dose of glutathione in the body, but don't uh, have the risk of developing an allergic reaction to it. If uh, if the combination of glutathione and berber and vanilla don't work, then I usually uh, resort to uh, coffee enemas, uh, organic uh, coffee enemas, uh, rarely, rarely uh, to uh, fibers and clay and, uh, and even charcoal when, when everything else fails. The problem with the charcoal is it binds everything in sight. So if you're on pharmaceutical drugs, you have to redose the pharmaceutical drugs and uh, any, any vitamins or minerals or herbs or anything else you took, you have to redose because the, the charcoal is going to bind all that stuff. So coffee enemas, since you brought it up, that's an interesting topic that I, I think many people find helpful. I do know that some people are hesitant to do them because they react to caffeine when taken orally, my observation has been that even if someone gets a little bit jittery with oral caffeine, that generally speaking, they still are able to do coffee enemas. Is that your observation as well? Yeah, I don't think it tends to rev up their nervous system nearly as much because when you when you put the uh, coffee in rectally, it goes into the hepatic portal circulation and the first stop is the liver. In the liver, it's metabolized and you know, not, not as much of it ends up out in the rest of the tissues. When you take it orally, a lot of it's absorbed, uh, you know, through the stomach, through the upper small intestine, gets in the bloodstream, travels around, finally ends up in the liver and gets metabolized. You know, so the so the coffee uh, uh, rectally is is uh, I think a safer way to go. When patients say, "Can I still have my coffee?" I said, "Yes, rectally as often as you wish." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But, so, yeah, go ahead. You know, I, I would just say, uh, you know, if a person has had a negative reaction previously from consuming coffee, start with a quarter cup of coffee. You know, you can you can put a quarter cup of coffee in with three quarters cups of water and put it in rectally. That's about the right volume to, to, to you know, have enough to retain. And, uh, and try to retain it for at least 10 minutes if you can before you get up on the toilet. Very good. Usually you lay, lay, on your ba- lay, lay on your side in the bathtub and run it in so if you have an accident, it doesn't make a mess on the floor. Good, good recommendation. So w- what is the goal of treatment in Lyme disease? Do you think that the goal is to eradicate every last Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia? And the reason I asked the question is I think that is the uh, approach that many people take, that if they can just kill the bugs, they'll get better. And so do you think we can eradicate these bugs, or do you think that they will be with us for the rest of our existence here, and it's more about getting back to a state of balance where we can live with a few of these microbes that may still be around? I think the latter. I, I, I don't think that most of the bugs that we get exposed to during our lifetime are, are eliminated from the body 100%. I think that there's oftentimes hiding forms somewhere, usually intracellular somewhere, and uh, when a cell ruptures and, and dies, then uh, the, those those microbes just find the next cell to go inside of. So the so the microbes that, are, that, that love to be inside of our cells uh, tend to persist. I think, and you know, Borrelia, uh, Bartonella, uh, love to to remain intracellular. And uh, so I think that uh, what happens is you lower the load enough. The, you know, the, these are immune suppressive bugs, so when you lower the load enough, the immune system gets stronger. When the immune system gets stronger, it uh, co- you know, goes around and starts uh, you know, scavenging for the, for, for the remaining bugs and keeping them in check. 
And so that's why I don't think that you have to do you know, the account support program or any other program lifelong. You do it for a time until your immune system is back on top and the, and the bug is suppressed. And then once the uh, once the immune system is on top, then uh, you keep you keep it there by doing stress reduction techniques on a regular basis, by getting enough sleep, by you know eating the right foods, getting, drinking enough water, getting some fresh air and some exercise, and so on. If you go through a really severe stress, whether that's a, a motor vehicle motor vehicle accident or a, a emergency appendectomy or a death of a loved one or a loss of a job or something else uh, major, then you don't wait till you're you're severely symptomatic again before you start treatment. You go ahead and start taking some of the things that you used to get well in the first place and take those for a month or two until the stress is subsided. And then you can probably stop those things without ever having gotten any symptoms. I think it's a whole lot better way to go. Yeah, that's a great recommendation. So one of the popular topics over the last several years has been CCSVI, and so I wanted to get your thoughts on that, the chronic cerebrospinal venous insufficiency, and this was talked about years ago um, in the realm of MS and the restriction of the jugular veins. There were some people that had various balloon procedures and other things done. And so maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what is CCSVI, what are the underlying causes is it something that's found outside of MS? And if so, how common is it in Lyme patients? Yeah. Well, Dr. Zamboni was the one that gave that condition its label, uh, I think about 2005. And uh, he, his wife uh, developed multiple sclerosis suddenly. And uh, he was an imaging doctor over in Italy. So he started doing imaging procedures on her and found that she had a, a, a narrowing of her jugular veins. And he thought, well, that cannot be normal. So... He got out of the balloon and dilated her jugular veins, and all of a sudden her MS went away. He was shocked, and, uh, surprised, and happy. Uh, so he decided to do imaging, uh, the venography imaging on the next 65 patients that he, that he saw that had MS. And he found that that same stenosis in the jugular veins or the azygous veins was present in a large percentage of them. Uh, essentially all of them, but it was a condition that was not found in patients that that came in for other conditions uh, in, in his clinic. So he said, "Well, this is a, you know a, a clear distinction between the you know, patients with MS and patients without MS." So he did a balloon angioplasty on some of those other patients, and many of them got better for a time, but not almost none of them stayed well long term. And almost all of them got recurrence of symptoms after some weeks or months. And uh, Dietrich Klinghart, uh, you know, read, read that study and said, "Why? Wow, this must be some type of uh, you know uh, inflammatory sclerotic stenotic type process that keeps recurring." And uh, I said, well, "We can find that out fast enough." So, uh, so Dr. Hickey and I in Dallas did a, a series of uh, of, uh, of imaging procedures on uh, patients with advanced Lyme disease because Dietrich had found the the MS was not just in MS or the the CCSVI was not just in MS patients but also in in almost all his severe chronic uh, Lyme patients, as well as his uh, more severe children with autism. And uh, so, uh, and, and Dietrich found also that the this, balloon this angioplasty didn't persist, the effect, the benefit didn't persist. He found it, it almost all had recurrence. So, anyway, when Dr. Hick, Hickey and I did uh, imaging procedures in Dallas on patients with chronic Lyme disease, we found the same thing that uh, Dietrich did, that uh, even though they didn't have the diagnosis or the label of MS yet, they, they all had this uh, CCSVI condition by, uh, by ultrasound Doppler duplex imaging according to Zamboni's criteria. And, and all of them had either red streaks or white streaks over the jugular veins on uh, infrared uh, imaging tomography. Uh, so the tomography we found was 100% correlated with the CCSVI by ultrasound Doppler in 35 patients. So we thought, well, maybe we don't even need to do the ultrasound Doppler imaging because that's a you know, $600 to $1,200 procedure, maybe we can just do a, uh, you know, a uh, infrared imaging tomography, a left anterior oblique and a right anterior oblique with an infrared camera will tell us with a high predictive accuracy whether they have that condition or not. So we did that in a group of patients and, uh, and decided to, to see if we could make a difference uh, in the inflammation so we put them on uh, herbal antimicrobial agents that energetically tested to neutralize the energetic disturbance that they had in their jugular veins. So we were, we were not focusing on the entire body. We we're just focusing on what can we do for the jugular veins. So we came up with these herbals, and then I gave the patients proteolytic enzymes 30 minutes before food with water only, 
uh, that included, uh, in some cases, bromelain, in some cases, uh, papaya leaf enzymes, in some cases, uh, mumbokinase, in some cases, natokinase, in some cases, serapeptase. But whatever proteolytic enzyme they tested best for and whatever herb they tested best for is what we gave them. And also some, some drainage remedies, usually bourbon and vanilla combination. And then 30 minutes after the, the dose of the antimicrobial agent that we gave, we had the patient shine an infrared light on their jugular veins on each side. And the purpose of doing that was to use the infrared light to stimulate the nitric oxide production in the local region, which would then dilate the uh, little capillaries and, and uh, arterioles to bring more of the treatment to that place than any other place in the body. So we had them do this uh, uh, oral herbal ingestion, enzyme ingestion, 30 minutes before food, twice a day with water only, and the, uh, the drainage reviews as needed uh, for the next, uh, next four months, 12 and a half days on and one and a half day off. And uh, the same cyclic cycling uh, pattern that we do for, for, for Lyme disease. And uh, at the end of four months, we, we uh, energetically tested them. None of them tested to have any abnormalities in the jugular veins anymore. Then we did infrared imaging thermography, found no abnormalities on the infrared imaging thermography that had been abnormal before. And then we repeated their ultrasound Doppler duplex imaging, and the stenosis of the jugular veins had resolved. So, so we found that we could resolve you know, CCSDI in patients with chronic Lyme disease. Now, what I'd love to do is a, is a study with a large group of MS patients to see if we can do the same thing. You know, if we can, you know, get, get rid of the stenosis in patients with, uh, with MS, you know, how many of them would get well? You know, Dr. Dr. Reinflash in, in Germany in 1863 found that uh, every, he's a pathologist, he found that every patient uh, that had MS had uh, had the little plaques or little uh, microhemorrhages right around the jugular, right around the uh, intracerebral venous plexuses. So you know, it, we see the the white plaques on the on the brain scans, thinking that that is the uh, you know the the, the culprit uh, of uh, of uh, MS. And uh, but he proved that 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 what caused those little plaques in the brain were leaking of red blood cells out of the veins into the tissue. Red blood cells breaking down, releasing hemoglobin. Hemoglobin breaking down, releasing iron. Iron, a free radical, causing free radical damage to the brain cells. And so he proved in 1963 what we're talking about today. That sounds like a much more uh, approachable way to treat this than the balloon procedure. And, I, and that was my observation as well, that it didn't seem like people had lasting uh, benefit, especially if they hadn't already addressed the things that you're talking about here, the microbes and the toxicity and those things that were probably driving inflammation in that area as well. So that's right. uh, that, that's fantastic. It's great to hear an update on that. It sounds like that uh, treatment approach has come quite a ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk a little bit about dental cavitation. So this seems to be a problem that many people with Lyme disease um, eventually find that they also are dealing with. I'm wondering how often do you see dental cavitations holding someone back from making forward progress? And then are we getting any closer to a solution for dental cavitations that does not require a significant surgical procedure? Well, uh, I, I find that dental cavitations are a huge issue uh, for uh, patients with any kind of chronic disease, including uh, Lyme disease. And uh, the German doctors uh, have found that for for, uh, for century, for, for decades at least, uh, maybe even a century, that the that the uh, dental issues contribute to cancer for sure. You know, uh, I, I interviewed Dr. Joseph Issels back in 1996 when I wrote the book on cancer. And uh, he said that uh, in his clinic, that if the patient walked in, he would ask them this question, have you been to see the biological dentist first? And if they said no, he said, get out of here. I can't help you until you go do that. So it was a huge issue that they recognized back there in the 1950s. So uh, what, what I find is that it's, uh, it's not just the places where teeth have been extracted, but it's also significant periodontal disease that uh, has a role. It's also the, the places where they have root canals in their teeth that have a role. It's the place where they have uh, dental implants, uh, especially titanium implants. Uh, and so it's all of these factors that are creating a toxic focus in the body. The German definition of a toxic focus is a place in the body where there's a much higher concentration of man-made toxins, biotoxins, and microbes than any other place in the body. And you know, 80% of the toxic foci, according to the Germans, research is in the head and neck, 
uh, so that would be in the jaws, in the paranasal sinuses, in the tonsils, rarely in the mastoids, the uh, mastoid air cells, uh, and then the, the other 20% are elsewhere in the body, like in the appendix, in the fallopian tubes, in the prostate, in the gallbladder, in the bile ducts, and so on. So if you're, if you're going to try to get somebody well, you really need to get rid of as many of the toxic foci as you can. And since most of them are in the head and neck, that's where you need to concentrate. Uh, you know, maybe we we'll talk a little bit later about uh, about the paranasal sinuses because that that sometimes is, is is as big an issue as the dental. But what what we found on the on the uh, dental issues is that uh, if if a patient uh, does uh, an oral health poultice, that's a a, a mixture of, chi- of of seven Chinese herbs in a powder, and you take a wet cotton gauze and you cut it. A four, four inch by four inch cotton gauze, you cut it into four strips, one inch wide by four inches long, and you put the, the oral health powder up and down that wet gauze and fold it upon itself. You make a little herbal sandwich. And you can put that inside the mouth between the cheek and the gum, and oftentimes, uh, if you do that two hours once a day for eight weeks, about 80% of the time, you'll clear up the uh, mastitis cavitation. That won't always stay cleared up. Uh, for sure, it will not stay cleared up if there's a root canal in that in that area, if there's an implant in that area. But if it's just a, a cavitational site or a periodontal process, sometimes it'll stay fixed. Now, if, if it doesn't stay fixed, uh, then what we usually do, the second step, is to use uh, what we call intraosseous injection of ozone. So that's making a little tiny burr hole uh, through the gum, through the bone, into the hole in the bone that's not supposed to be there, and then use uh, another syringe to fill that uh, that hole up with uh, with ozone. It's, it's not a high concentration of ozone, usually about, about 40 gamma or 40 uh, uh, microns per, 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 liter, per liter and uh, micrograms per liter. So uh, that uh, that concentration is uh, is enough to where you, uh, it's, it's mostly oxygen, but it's enough to where it'll kill the anaerobic bugs in there really well. And most of these bugs that are in these cavitational sites are anaerobic uh, or those that don't like oxygen. And uh, so if you do the intraosseous injections first and then do the oral health after that and address the, uh, address the emotions that are related to that tooth, then you clear up probably 95% of them without any surgery. So where, where does the oral health product come from? Well, that comes from uh, Chris Geeing out of Dallas. Uh, his phone number is uh, 817-469-8823. Excellent. Eight, eight one, yeah, 817-469-8823. Good. Good to have new tools. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, Chris is a, is a great guy. Uh, he, he developed, he's the one that really developed that with my input about uh, 20, years ago, 20 years ago and still sells the stuff now. But we did a study in our practice and found that it was successful 80% of the time. Uh, and uh, I, I told a, a biological dentist out of Canada about it. He said, oh, I've been looking for something I can do for my patients that can't afford the dental surgery. So he, he tried it in a group of his patients and found that it works 85% of the time in his patients. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And is the, the herbal mix then, is it actually touching the gum or it's within the cotton gauze itself? No, no, you, you, you make a one inch wide by four inch long mm-hmm. cotton gauze strip and then you, you wet it, and you put a, a, the herb up and down the length of that and you fold the gauze upon itself so now the herb so is sandwiched, in, yeah. in, sandwiched in between the two layers. Got so it. once you put that gauze in the mouth, then you take an infrared light and shine it through the cheek, through the gauze, into the bone and carry the energy of the, of the mm-hmm. herb into the bone. And it's that energy that actually, uh, I think, does most of the work. Yeah, fantastic. So let's go ahead then and talk a little bit about sinus since you mentioned that. So in people with Lyme, mold illness, we commonly see staph or what's called Marcon. Some people have fungal overgrowths. What are some of the things that you see with the sinuses and are there some uh, ways to approach getting rid of those organisms from the sinuses that might be helpful for people to hear about? Yeah, but most people in my experience that have trouble in their sinuses have, uh, have fungus as a foundation. Uh, back in 1990, I was seeing a lot of patients with chronic recurrent bacterial sinusitis. And when I started doing muscle testing on them, I found they all had fungus in their sinuses. And so I started treating the fungus and not doing anything at all about the bacteria. And when I got the funguses cleared up, they, they no longer had recurrent bacterial sinusitis. And about 10 years later, either Hopkins or Mayo did a, a published a study that said the cause of chronic recurrent bacterial infection in the sinuses is chronic fungal infection in the sinuses. So, so I was finally vindicated. But uh, anyway, 
I, uh, I, I find that uh, these, uh, if a patient goes into a mold-infested room, whether it's uh, you know the house that they live in, the workplace that they work in, or just health club or a, or a family member's house or a friend's house, and get a big load of, of mold or fungus in their paranasal in their in their nose, that those uh, microbes can migrate into their paranasal sinuses and set up shop and grow and divide and multiply and live there long term. Now, if the if the mold or fungus is still in the place that they're living in, they're not going to be able to get it rid of, get rid of it in their sinuses because they're continuing to get it in every day. So you have to clean out the workplace. You have to clean out the home place uh, as far as mold and fungus. Now it's a challenge sometimes to find the mold and fungus because it's not visible. You know, sometimes it's hidden. You know, it's uh, behind the drywall, and the only way you can find it is with an infrared gun shining. You know, just pointing at the drywall, seeing that there's a lower temperature there than there is in the, the drywall immediately adjacent to where the moisture is uh, keeping it cool. Uh, but anyway, molds and funguses uh, can't survive without moisture. So you have to, first thing you have to do is find find out where the mold and fungus is, and then find out what the water source is that keeps it going, and then stop the water source, whether it's a roof leak or a, a sink leak or a, a leak behind the dry, you know the, dry, the washing machine or the dishwasher or the clothes washer. Or, Whatever, uh, and, and then once you once you get that that uh, that moisture source uh, stopped, then you can get rid of the bugs. So, is there something then? Once the moisture source source is stopped within the home environment, is there something that you find works well for then getting rid of the colonization of those organisms within the the sinuses? Yeah, well, yeah, before you can do that, you have to get rid of the the, the mold or fungus that's still there in the walls because yeah, they're still you know they're they. they if you've got a good colony of them, they're, they're producing enough moisture to keep the next next generation alive. So you actually have to rip out the building materials and replace it with new, uh, uncontaminated building materials. And then you have to run uh, you know, some type of pure air purification process in the house to try to get rid of all the mold spores in the house and the air conditioning system and so on. And uh, that, that sometimes takes quite a long time. I like to use the uh, Citrus Safe uh, fogging of the house with uh, citrus oil. Uh, to get rid of the mold fungus because uh, most of them can't survive that, uh, that citrus oil. And then once you got rid of it in the house, then you can start working on trying to get rid of it in the paranasal sinuses. Now, what I find it takes to do that is not a neti pot because a neti pot is just not enough force to get enough saline into a sinus in order to flush the sinus out. So you usually have to use a bulb syringe or a piston syringe or a, a device called a sinugator or something like that. So a sinugator is kind of like a, a water pick you know, that you use for your teeth, but it's got a, a special nozzle on it that jams up snugly into the, into the nostril and won't let any water around it. And so when you uh, use that, uh, that sinugator, uh, you know, you're know you just going to try to get your head positioned over the sink and put, your, put the tip of the nozzle into the nose and then push the button and start. It's a battery operated device, so it just starts pulsing uh, saline in the nose. And some of those pulses will actually go through the ostia, the little soft tissue openings of the, of the paranasal sinuses from the, from the nasal passage, and carry some of that saline in. The saline is pretty good at washing stuff out, but not very good at killing stuff off or healing the, the lining of the mucosa of the uh, paranasal sinuses. So what I found that to do that is that you need to add to the saline. By the way, this is warm saline, not cold saline, because the, the th tissues don't like cold. But warm saline, you add to that uh, uh, the lily of the desert whole leaf aloe vera or a comparably effective uh, whole leaf aloe vera. Uh, the aloe vera uh, is a healing substance. So when, when you get a little bit of that in the paranasal sinus, it will it'll heal the mucosa so the mucosa doesn't act like a hamburger meat to grow more bugs. And then uh, in addition, if a patient is not sensitive to iodine, I usually mix with the uh, sinus irrigate also Lugol's iodine. Now, uh, most people that try one drop of Lugol's iodine in a cup of sinus irrigate, if they have per if they have infection in the paranasal sinuses, are going to uh, scream bloody murder because it's going to burn like heck. So I say, well, you know, don't start with a full drop. Start with a quarter drop or an eighth of a drop. They say, how do you do that? Yeah, I even had a CEO that said, how do you do a quarter yeah, drop? The common question <laughs> that everyone always asks. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. So I said, well, what if you put one drop of, of Lugol's iodine, 2% uh, solution, into a spoon, and you added three drops of water, and you mix that around, and you took one drop of that and put it into your cup, what would you have? I'd have a quarter drop. That's right. 
So if you want an eighth, eighth of a drop, then it's one drop of bluebell zionine plus seven drops of water. And then you do one eighth and you build up, you know, every time by adding an eighth or adding a quarter of a drop to get up to, uh, you know, two or three drops of the bluebell zionine, 2% per cup. And that's usually enough to kill the, the critters off. Iodine is an excellent uh, antimicrobial, and it also penetrates biofilm, unlike a lot of other remedies. And so, you know, Great. Get, get, get rid of the staph and get rid of the fungus and get rid of the other critters in there that produce biofilm. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. So, how frequently would you say that the uh, water damage building scenario is an issue for patients that are not recovering? In my observation, it's, it's very, very common. And I'm just wondering, is that something that you also see that a majority of people are also dealing with? Uh, when a person lives more than uh, 15 miles from the coast, it's a, it's only about 40 or 50 percent of the population that are chronically ill. <laughs> If you live on the coast, it's seventy to eighty percent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. it's it's, it's, com it's common, really common. Yeah, I agree. So let's talk a little bit about parasites. Um, I'm curious, how often do you see these coming up? I know you have uh, some herbal options built into the Cowden support right. protocol to help address the body and in, in dealing with parasites as well. Do you think that the timing of the moon cycle is important when you're doing parasite treatments, especially for the larger parasites? And then what's the duration that people maybe need to focus on parasites uh, to, to really reduce them in the body? Yeah, uh, it depends on the type of parasite and, and the number of different species of parasites that a person has, how long it's going to take to get rid of those. But uh, it's not uncommon for it to take you know, six months or a year or longer to get rid of all the, paras the parasites in the body, the worms and the protozoal parasites. And uh, the, the, the count support program has some pretty good antiparasitics in it. The, uh, the Enula is quite good. The Mora is quite good. The, the uh, Comanda is quite effective as an antiparasitic. The uh, Banderol is a pretty good antiprotozoal, not as good as an anti-helminthic. Uh, the Tangrana is a, is a pretty good uh, antiprotozoal and anti-helminthic you know, for, for worms and protozoa. So, so some people you know, make a switch sometime during their uh, count support program from, uh, from one herb to Tangrana or just add Tangrana in to their program. Well, perfectly on a 12 and a half day cycle when they're not taking Commander or Inula because those are those that are already pretty effective. Some patients uh, find that they need to really add something like uh, you know, artemisinin capsules into the program or, uh, or even liposomal artemisinin into the program to get rid of the parasites. I usually don't uh, uh, resort to the pharmaceutical antiparasitics uh, you know, in, in the beginning because I find that a lot of times you can eliminate the uh, parasites without going with the pharmaceutical route. And sometimes there's toxicity from the, from the pharmaceutical antiparasitics, either central nervous system toxicity or uh, liver toxicity, or sometimes even uh, killing off too many of the friendly bacteria in the gut, which is also not a good thing. And uh, so if they can get rid of the parasites just with the herbal tinctures that are, that are absorbed mostly in the stomach and very rarely make it into the small and large intestine, then that's probably a better way to go. Very good. Yeah, and my observation over the years has been that the protozoa are probably as big or bigger of an issue than, than the larger parasites. I think when people hear parasites, they think of, of the worms, but it seems to me that the protozoa play a very significant role in our health challenges as well. Do you, do you want to comment on that? No, I think that's true. Uh, and, you know, the, the protozoal parasites uh, t tend to migrate out into other tissues earlier. Uh, than the worms do. A lot of times the worms like it in the gut because they get plenty of food there and they just stay there. But uh, but the but the protozoal parasites very commonly go, go to other tissues, you know, get out in the lymphatic system, get out to the spleen and the liver and the pancreas and the you know, gallbladder and bile ducts and elsewhere. But uh, worm, worms are more likely to stay in the gut. You know, for, for, for gut worms, I like a, a food-grade diatomaceous earth, a, a teaspoon of that uh, twice a day, about five days out of every seven. Or, uh, or 12 days out of every 14 uh, to, to, to do that, just a few cycles to try to get rid of some of the worm parasites in the gut in addition to the, you know, the herbs. And uh, I, I do use the uh, full moon cycle uh, after I feel like I've gotten rid of the adult uh, parasites, whether it's the adult worms or the adult protozoa. <clears throat> you know, the, the protozoa produce cysts, and those cysts can hatch and form a new crop of, of adult protozoal uh, parasites anytime. And uh, likewise, the worms lay eggs and uh, can make a new crop anytime they want to. 
uh, the adult tapeworm uh, makes an average, uh, produces an average of 1,000 eggs per day. So in just one year of having tapeworm, you got probably 365,000 eggs inside you that could hatch at any time. But uh, what what uh, uh, the old time uh, health practitioners found was that uh, the eggs were most likely to hatch and the cysts were most likely to hatch during the full moon. Now, don't, don't ask me to explain why. That's just an observation. And, but I found that their observation is, is, per, is accurate. So what I usually have patients do once they finish the treatment of the adult parasites is to, is to take some more of the antiparasitic treatment from two days before the full moon until two days after the full moon, every full moon, for several months, six to twelve months, and what I tell people to do is, if you get a if you get a Herx reaction during those five days of full moon treatment, then you've got new adults that you that you need to treat. So don't just do that five days and that five days only. Skip two days after that five days, and then do another five days right after that, and then wait till the next full moon and see if you get a Herx reaction during that one. If you don't, then it's just the five days. But if you do, it's five days off two days on another five days. They just keep doing that regimen until they're free of parasites. Yeah, and it's interesting because I know you and, and Dr. Klinghart have talked for years about how we need to do the parasite piece fairly early in the treatment because of the possibility that these parasites, the larger ones particularly, house other smaller organisms. And I've been seeing research yeah. on that coming out more in the last several months as well that's been kind of validating uh, yeah. that idea as well that I know you've talked about for quite some time. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I think it's pretty likely that uh, that these uh, smaller creatures, uh, viruses, uh, bacteria, and so on, are are found inside the guts of the worms. And uh, if you don't treat the worms first, as soon as the worms poop, then you got a new crop of bacteria and viruses. So. Really need to get rid of the worms that's, earlier. <laughs> that's a lovely thought. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked a little about EMFs. Um, I know that there are people, and, and even more now than a few years ago, people that are really electromagnetically hypersensitive and, and can't really even function in the world. And so I'm interested in your thoughts about mitigating that EMF stress. Um, what do you recommend for minimizing exposures? And then have you found any of the wearable devices or anything that people can take internally beyond the standard kind of reduction strategies that can also support the body with the EMF exposures? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, pe in my experience, people that uh, have a lot of heavy metal overload in the body are much more sensitive to electromagnetics than people that don't have a lot of heavy metal overload. So it's really important to, to keep working on getting down the, the metal load. You know, the, the Nutrimax company has a couple of uh, uh, herbs that I use often to try to lower the metal load, and that's the uh, algus uh, and the uh, cilantro. And that's SEA lantro uh, because it has uh, three, you know, it has cilantro in it, but it has uh, also chlorella and uh, a, um, a, a brown algae collected off the coast of uh, South America that's been quantum imprinted. To, uh, to be able to shake loose from the cells, the heavy metals, and the radioactive substances. So if you get the heavy metals out, that, that does help quite a bit. Now, the, uh, the, the first thing that you have to do with EMF is you have to lower the load. Absolutely have to lower the load. And uh, if you can just lower the load at bed, you know, from, time, from bedtime until the, the time they wake up in the morning, that helps tremendously. So you know, go turn. You know, make sure there's no cordless phone in the house. Make sure there's no uh, you know, cell phone beside the bed. Uh, turn off the breaker that goes the, that goes to the bedroom in the adjacent room, so there's no electricity coming there. Uh, you know, don't have a plug-in alarm clock right beside the bed or a TV plugged in right at the foot of the bed. That's a bad idea. Uh, but you know, reduce the EMF uh, as much as you can. The low, the low frequency uh, reduction is not very difficult to do. That's the you know 100 the, the, the 60 hertz in this country or 50 hertz in Europe uh, frequency is not very difficult to uh, to get rid of a lot of that. Uh, by, by just turning the breaker off. The bigger problem is the, is the high-frequency EMF uh, because you know, the, the cell phone companies are putting up cell towers you know, more and more and more all the time, and they're no longer satisfied with 4G, so now they're going to 5G and 6G. And you know, I, I would bet you know, within the next five years we'll have 8G, uh, 8 gigahertz of uh, cell phone towers. But those are pounding us you know, uh, all, the, all the time and, uh, and, and causing... Disruption of the cell membranes, causing leaky cell membranes, causing uh, 
potassium to leak out of the cell, lowering the transmembrane potential, increasing the risk of seizures, increasing the risk of cardiac arrhythmias, eventually increasing the risk of cancer. So, so all those are, all those are problems, uh, and we, we need to do whatever we can do about that. And so people that are sensitive to the high-frequency EMF really probably should sleep under a metalized cloth canopy. You know, so if they're on the second floor, they have to have that canopy. Uh, they have to have that canopy material underneath the bed, as well as on top of the uh, on top of the bed, and all four all four sides of the bed, and make sure that there's no gaps. You know, that the cloth touches the floor all the way around, uh, so that there's no place for EMF to get in. And so you're you're basically taking a breather, if you will, for about eight hours a night while you're inside the canopy from the high frequency EMF, and that and that does help. Now. The uh, other thing that uh, I found that helps during the day is a, uh, is a, is a Schumann wave generator. And uh, the one that I use most often is called a, a Vita Set Generator or VSG. I have and, one right here on my desk. <laughs> hey, there you go. That, that, that comes from Pulse Tech, P U L S E D T E C H dot com. And Pulse Tech, uh, I think, has really thought that out well. They, they have uh, the five different frequencies that Dr. Schumann described back in the 1950s, and that were subsequently verified by scientists to be the frequencies generated by lightning strikes hitting the Earth and reverberating off the uh, ionosphere 60 miles up. But those five frequencies are, are, are played repeatedly throughout the day, and so there's no way for the body to really become uh, uh, sensitized to those frequencies because it's always changing. Or at least that's been my experience so far. And so those frequencies are uh, crowding out, covering over some of the some some of the harmful EMF pollution that, that we get exposed to during the day. Now, in in, in Dr. Schumann's day, and, and for a few years after that, you could measure Schumann waves with the right instrumentation almost anywhere on the planet. Now there is no place in the United States where you can still measure Schumann waves because the man-made pollution has so crowded it out. Now, you can go out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean or into the Himalayas or maybe to Antarctica and measure it, but most of the other ha habitated places on the planet you can't even measure it anymore. So uh, when they, back in his day, when they uh, did the electroencephalograms on patients, they found that the elect electroencephalogram primary brainwave spikes were perfectly almost perfectly the same frequency as the earth frequencies. So, so that's the, the, the 7.83 hertz, right? Well, 7.83 up to 33.8, I think it is. Okay. But there's, there's five frequencies. That, that The others are harmonics of the 7.83 hertz, uh, 7.83 cycles per second. That's the number of lightning strikes on the earth's surface every, every, minute, every second. And uh, uh, so when, uh, when you... Back in those days, they found that the, the brain waves were firing off at almost exactly the same frequency as the Schumann waves. Okay, so the Schumann waves were guiding our brains how to fire properly. Now you can't measure the Schumann waves. What's happening to our brains? Probably not good stuff. Yeah. Now, when, when, they put, uh, when they put volunteer students into underground bunkers back in Schumann's day uh, and, and prevented them from being exposed to the Schumann waves, they all became sick. But when they introduced artificial Schumann waves down in the bunkers, they all became well again. Now, when they put the first astronauts into outer space without the Schumann waves beyond 60 miles, they all became sick. But when they artificially induced Schumann waves into the spacecraft, they all became well again. So now, basically every human on Earth, almost every human on Earth, is, is an experiment. We're, we're underground students in a bunker or we're, we're uh, you know, astronauts in outer space beyond 60 miles. Because we can't sense the Schumann waves anymore, that's not a good plan. So, so that's why we have an increasing incidence of, of electromagnetic pollution. I think electromagnetic sensitivity. I mean, so we have we have uh, thirty percent of the population, according to uh, Dr. Mike DeHavis, are electromagnetically sensitive already, and three percent are, are profoundly electromagnetically sensitive. My wife is one of those, mm -hmm. and so that's why I live out in the middle of nowhere. You know, the closest cell phone tower is uh, you know, close to a mile away. It's far enough away where it doesn't uh, doesn't cause harm to her yet. <laughs> uh, and we have no Wi-Fi in the house. We have no electric smart meter on the house. We, uh, you know, have, we made sure we uh, turned appliances off in the bedroom so that there's no uh, low frequency about, and so on. So, 
So is there, uh, in all of the years that you've muscle tested, probably many devices that people have brought in that they've been wearing, have you found any of them that seem to protect you when you go out into the world and, and can't really do a whole lot about it? Yeah, I've, I've uh, run across uh, one more recently that seems to be better than the others I've tested before uh, from uh, Energy Tools out of Oregon. And it's uh, they have different ones that, are, that have adhesive on it that you can attach to your cell phone or to your computer or to other appliances. And they also have one that you can wear around your neck. Now, if you're going to wear, wear the one around your neck, it needs to be perfectly centered over your sternum, your, your breastbone, not, not hanging low, not hanging high, but right, right in the center of your sternum to get the best effect. And uh, that one reduces the, the EMF effect on the patients about, about 40 to 60%, depending on the patient and the, and the place. Fantastic. So I wanted to ask a follow-up question on the cilantro that Nutramedics has. I know cilantro, just the regular tincture, one of the cautions with that is that people probably shouldn't be using it that have metal amalgams in their mouth. Is it okay to use the Nutramedic cilantro if you still have amalgam fillings or should that be avoided? Well, we found that it's, it's tolerated uh, fairly well if they're doing it on the schedule. That uh, On the count support program, it's not done every day. It's done uh, p- periodically during the count support program. Okay. And uh, you know, once a person gets the murky feelings out of their mouth, then they can go to doing it daily and probably should start doing it daily. But uh, we have found that if you try to do it daily while you still have murky feelings in your teeth, it's a bad idea. Okay, very good. That's helpful. So let's talk just a little bit then around chelation. So we talked about detox, metal detox. There are certainly people out there that feel like, oh, I just have to go do IV chelation and my heavy metal problem will go away. I've talked to many people that when you ask about metals, they say, but I did 10 IVs four years ago um, and my metals are not an issue. So do you think that detoxification is a daily and lifelong process or can something like a few IVs really make a significant difference? I think some IVs can make a difference, but uh, but the, it's, you're deceiving yourself if you think that you just do that once and you're finished with it for life. Uh, because uh, we we all store lead in our bone matrix. We know that the average human now has 600 times more lead in their bone matrix than a person that lived 600 years ago. You know that, and that's because of all the uh, coal that's been burned over the last hundred years, probably, which has lead in it. You know, the, the Chinese are still burning massive amounts of coal in China to produce uh, energy for, for electricity over there. And that, that, uh, that lead that they put into their air comes by the jet stream across the Pacific into the United States. So people in the United States are getting hammered pretty heavily with lead. And, and there's also some mercury in that same, uh, same air. You know, and the, the radioactives is another issue. Uh, you know, in the United States, the highest instance of cancer is close to nuclear power plants. And, uh, you know, when, the, when they had the Fukushima tsunami back in uh, 2011, March of 2011, uh, they started measuring, the, 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 the Japanese government went out to the site and saw and to try to decide how big a hole they needed to dig to, to bury the radioactive contaminated materials that were strewn over several acres there. And uh, they decided they couldn't uh, build a, a dig a hole big enough, so they decided to burn it. Thank goodness they were signed onto a treaty that prevented them from burning all in one day. Otherwise, we'd, we'd all be dead by now uh, but because there was that much radioactivity. So they've been burning a little bit of it every, every week since that time. And, uh, and so that uh, radioactive elements get, in, get into the air, go across the jet stream, across the Pacific into the United States. By, by two months after the, uh, the, the, they started burning those radioactive containment materials in, in uh, Fukushima, Japan, the, the uh, radioactivity counts in the United States and all the radioactivity uh, monitoring centers went up 100-fold. Okay? And the governments decided to fix the problem, so they, they, they mandated that they all stop me- measuring. <laughs> Oh, what a solution that is. That's right. That's a great solution. So, so anyway, if you haven't been doing something for radioactivity, then you're going to be you know, filling up your body with radioactivity. If you fill your body up with cesium, then that's going to increase your risk of, uh, of 
uh, soft tissue sarcomas. And if you built, filled your body up with radioactive strontium, that's going to increase your risk of, of uh, you know, osteosarcomas or bone cancers. Uh, so that's not a good plan. If you, uh, you know, there's also radioactive active materials that are getting into the thyroid of people in this country because almost nobody takes enough iodine. So the iodine uh, is not able to crowd out the, the little bit that they get. It's not able to crowd out the radioactivity that's in the thyroid. So people's thyroids are shutting down left and right. So it's it's a it's a fairly big problem now. The the only only products that I'm aware of in the country that that are addressing that radioactivity. Uh, on, on a, an effective basis is the uh, two products from the Nutramax, the cilantro and the algas. Very good. Yeah, that's that's definitely important. And I've heard many people uh, that do energetic testing specifically comment about how much more they see radiation-related things coming up in their clients as compared to prior to Fukushima. So it's uh, it's, it's frightening when you really stop and think about it. Let, let's yeah. talk a little bit about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That has come up as a real common topic over the past few years. Um, some people say it's because now we have tests for it, but certainly the, the, the number of people that I talk to that have more bloating after meals and a lot of uh, symptoms certainly seems to have increased. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts around um, why is there such a common issue now with SIBO and then have you seen any things that might support uh, eliminating small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Yeah, uh, when they dug up the uh, caveman and the glacier up in the Alps uh, that was 5,000 years old and analyzed the uh, microbes in his gut, he had over 20,000 species of friendly microbes in his gut. According to research done by one of the Ivy League schools here in this country about 10 or 15 years ago, we're down to less than 500 species in our guts. Okay, now, uh, those bacteria are not superfluous. They have a purpose. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, a lot of our immune function comes from that. Probably at least 70% of our immune function comes from the friendly bacteria in our gut. And uh, now, not only are we uh, consuming pesticides and herbicides, which also have an antimicrobial effect, you know, kill off a bunch of friendly bacteria in the gut from pesticides and herbicides, and also massive amounts of uh, pharmaceutical uh, antibiotics intentionally added to the uh, to the animals that we eat, you know, the cattle, the, the chickens, the other uh, other commercially produced animals. But uh, the, the very worst of all, I think, is the uh, BT genetically modified foods. So the bacill Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria that produces an antibiotic in its body. And so Monsanto, in, in their infinite wisdom, took the gene out of that bacteria that, uh, that codes for the production of that antibiotic and spliced it into corn seeds and uh, soy, soybean seeds and other seeds. And so now when we eat those plants, we're producing an antibiotic in our gut. Now, not only that, if, if, the, if that plant is broken down just the right way, the gene from that seed can get incorporated into the bacteria of our gut. And so the bacteria of our gut start produces, starts producing antibiotics. And so we wonder why we have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. You know, we, have, we have bugs growing in there that are resistant to the pesticides, resistant to the herbicides, resistant to the, to the pharmaceutical antibiotics that are added to the feeds, and resistant to this BT toxin. So what do we have? We have a bunch of monsters in our gut. That's a great plan. So, so how do we fix it? We have to go back to the basics. My opinion is, uh, since since uh, last last year there was two billion pounds of of a Roundup sprayed in the United States, and statistically speaking, if it rained, there was a seventy percent chance that the, that the Roundup was in the rain. That means there is no such thing as organic anymore anywhere, unless you're growing it inside of a greenhouse with charcoal filters on the air intake for the greenhouse. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so so my, my belief is that if we want to if we want to survive as as a, uh, a species, we need to go back to growing our own food inside of greenhouses or inside of our house. Now, all of your listeners can look up something fascinating on, on the internet. It's called the four foot farm. Four foot farm, and so there you're talking about building uh, inside of five gallon buckets some uh, a, a growth tower to grow plants in. And you put it in front of a south-facing window, and the sun coming in the south-facing window provides the sun. And you, do, you don't have to add very much water to this because it's indoors and it's not drying out like it would as much uh, outside. And, uh, and so this, uh, this four-foot farm will grow enough food for four people. 
okay, you're round. Wow. You know, it's, 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 it's so, so you have your greenhouse basically inside your house. Now, uh, for, for people that have bigger, bigger space, you know, you can put a, a greenhouse in your backyard. You can build a greenhouse uh, fairly inexpensively with PVC pipe and with, uh, with some of the, uh, the right uh, clear plastic to, to drape over it and uh, it grow you know, larger volumes of, you know, for neighbors that uh, they don't have a, a south-facing window. So let's carry on with the diet conversation a little bit. So let's assume that people know uh, that organic is important, that uh, high quality food is important. doesn't mean everyone's doing it, but that message I think, I think we've kind of talked about. What are your thoughts around eating meat versus not eating meat? There's the high fat people, the high protein people, the, you know, what, what diet do you think works best for people that are dealing with something like chronic Lyme or MS or these neurological type conditions? Yeah, diet, diet is huge. Uh, I would say it's in the top three as far as things that we have to address in order to get well from a chronic illness. Uh, emotions, diet, and, you know, I call it the lifestyle things like uh, no smoking, enough rest, enough uh, relaxation, enough uh, fresh water, enough uh, clean air, enough exercise. That's the lifestyle stuff. But uh, you know, as far as the diet, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, there, there's a variation from, a, from person to person because of our genetics, because of our uh, biochemical individuality, uh, that you can't say if one diet fits all. I wrote a book in 2014 called Foods That Fit a Unique You, and it helped to explain that and how to figure out what diet a person should consider for themselves as an individual. Because, you know, there's so many, there's hundreds of diet books out there and everyone of them said, this is, this is the best diet for everybody. No, there is no best diet for everybody because everybody's an individual. There's a few diets out there that work for maybe 70 or 80% of the population, but it still doesn't work for the other 20 or 30%. So, uh, you know, th these are the important factors uh, that, I, that I summarized from that book. Um, eat a food, eat a diet that's appropriate for your metabolic type. So you measure your saliva pH in the morning time before you get out of, you know, before you go eat or drink anything, and see what it is. If it's if it's below 6.8, you're too acidic. If it's above 7.2, you're too alkaline, and you want to adjust your pH to the 6.8 to 7.2 range. Now you do that with food choices. You do that with uh, avoiding allergens by doing the cocoa pulse test. You figure out what what, what allergies you have. Uh, uh, to foods just by checking your pulse before a meal, checking your pulse again 15 minutes after a meal. If it goes up 15 beats, you have an allergy for sure. If it goes up 10 to 14 beats, you probably have an allergy. So, so you do the coca pulse test, you do the food, you know, eating the foods that are right for your blood type, and you take uh, some, some supplemental trace minerals to try to replenish the minerals that have been pulled out of your body by all the acids that are that are there uh, in the in the metabolic process of breaking down foods. You know, the most, most acid-producing of all foods are the, the, the I call it the, the, the American favorites. You know, that's, that's uh, you know, cheese and milk and wheat and uh, white potatoes and meat. Okay, that's, that's our diet. And that's, those are all acid-producing. So most people in this country that are sick are too acidic. A few people in this country are, are, are too alkaline because they have uh, ammonia-splitting bacteria in their gut or ammonia-splitting bacteria in their, in their tissues. Borrelia can, can split uh, you know, glycoproteins and release ammonia in the tissues. So some people that, that have really high ammonia levels in their in the serum are just so overloaded with Borrelia that they have that problem. Now, if you if you uh, are going to uh, you know, try to ba balance the pH, you also want to take a proteolytic enzyme 30 minutes before food with water only. That's why that's one of the reasons why serapeptase is in the calcium support program, because the proteolytic enzyme that you take 30 minutes before you eat uh, with water only will get into the bloodstream and will digest the fibrin that's plastered up against the capillary wall, so that the oxygen from the red blood cells can deliver through the capillary wall into the tissues and supply the tissues with enough oxygen to have aerobic metabolism. If you don't have enough stripping of the fibrin off the wall, then you're, you're delivering very little oxygen to the tissues, and that the oxygen then becomes so depleted that they have to go into anaerobic metabolism in their tissues, and that causes lactic acid production. Lactic acid makes the tissues more acidic and more, more ill. So, so that's, a, that's an important piece. Now, which foods to eat? If you're going to eat a meat, some people need to eat some meat because of their metabolic type, 
then they, they need to eat free-range meats, you know, free-range eggs, free-range chicken, free-range beef, uh, free-range bison, whatever, but but not stuff fed in a, in a crowded environment, not in a feedlot. Uh, if they're fed in a feedlot, what are they being fed? They're being fed uh, BT-modified corn and BT-modified soybean and BT-modified or genetically modified uh, cottonseed. You know, cottonseed is sprayed more heavily with, with Roundup than any other plant. Okay, because they want all the leaves to fall off before they harvest the, uh, the, the cotton fiber. And so, so you're getting massive amounts of, of, uh, of glyphosate uh, and other com- components of the Roundup in your, in your food if you're eating beef from a feedlot. So don't do that. Eat free range only. Make sure it's, it's free range and, and, ra- and range finished, not just, uh, not just fed on the range until the last few weeks of its life and then put in a feedlot to fatten it up. But you know, taken off the off the uh, grazing land and slaughtered immediately. Very good, very good. Um, I know you do a lot of energetic testing and use different tools for that. Are there any particular labs for people that are looking for information around Lyme disease and co-infections? Are there particular labs that are the ones that you utilize these days? I ran across an interesting one recently. It's called uh, Galaxy. And uh, Galaxy is, is doing polymerase chain, polymerase chain testing uh, for the DNA of a variety of different microbes. Uh, you can see that they intentionally, obviously, did not test for Borrelia because it's too, it's too uh, hot potato. It's too much of a hot potato. Uh, you know, uh, Steve Hines tried to put in a lab in, in Lubbock that was going to test for the DNA of, of Borrelia, and uh, he got stonewalled by the FDA and never got it uh, up and going. So, uh, so this other group was smarter and not uh, not going there. They they're, they're testing for for Babesia and Borrelia, and, uh, Babesia and Bartonella, and uh, some of the other microbes, but not for Borrelia. Now, uh, I'm I'm hopeful that my my friend Dr. Hai Chen will uh, get his lab moved from Toronto down to uh, to Phoenix, uh, because he has a method of testing for uh, DNA of microbes that's more sensitive less expensive and faster turnaround than the present. And uh, when that's when that's available, then I'll let you know. But that's uh, I think that's going to blow all the rest out of the water. Yeah, that's great. So maybe you can give us a few updates. We've talked a good deal about some of the Nutramedics products, but I'm interested in any other thoughts, any new products that may be coming. I know there's been a few of them that you mentioned that are newer over the past couple of years. What's happening with Nutramedics? Well, uh, the, the FDA has made it really challenging to, uh, to get anything to happen in this country because they, they now have influ- enforced the 1994 laws, uh, the CGMP laws. And so instead of you know, getting a product to market in about four months, like it used to be back in, in those days, it takes uh, over a year. Uh, and, and that's continuously pushing the envelope to try to get, get a new product out in a year. So that, that's, uh, that's really uh, you know, frustrating. But there are uh, several, you know, several in the pipeline. You know, other antimicrobials, uh, you know, some things that'll help a, a variety of chronic conditions. But who knows how long it'll take them to get it out, just because of the of this, you know, process that they have to go through now. Every conference that I go to, I run over to Mark Toothman at the booth and I say, "Hey, what's new?" <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's great. I just saw him a few weeks ago here at a conference in in Northern California. Uh, with the Cowden support program, I remember some time ago you talked about uh, Dr. Horowitz's patients and uh, the percentage of success that he was having. I think you then evaluated some of those patients to see and the ones that were non-responders, what were some of the reasons they weren't responding. And so uh, maybe some of those things have been adjusted over time relative to the protocol. But I'm curious, in people that are non-responders to the Cowden support protocol, my guess is that there's nothing that you can put into a bottle that's then going to address those things. So what are the things, if someone's on the Cowden support protocol and not getting fully to where they'd like to, what are some of the things that they need to think about? Yeah, well, uh, there, there's one thing that you could possibly add to the program that could be helpful, but we haven't because uh, there's so many people saying, oh, I got loose bowel already. I can't tolerate any vitamin C. So if you have an empiric program and you add vitamin C and the patients get diarrhea, then they say, well, I, I can't do any of this then. So they stop the whole thing. So we haven't, haven't uh, put uh, vitamin C in as a, as a mainstay, but uh, I think a lot of people would benefit from it. 
uh, and the and the vitamin C that the Nutrimax makes is a is a tapioca derived, not derived from corn, not derived from BT modified uh, anything, and uh, so it's usually really well tolerated. Uh, except for those rare people that have such messed up gut because they've taken so many antibiotics and uh, they're, they're, they don't have any friendly bacteria left in their gut, only pathological bacteria. But the reason that vitamin C is so important is because vitamin C is necessary for white blood cells to make peroxisomes. Now, uh, the, the, the peroxisome is a little granule inside the cell that digests whatever the cell white blood cell ingests. So if the white blood cell ingests a microbe and cannot digest it, then that bug grows and divides and multiplies inside the white blood cell. And finally, when, it, when there's enough copies of it, it ruptures the cell and breaks out and then starts invading other cells. So the white blood cell then becomes a metastasizing agent, if you will, for, for creature, creatures as well as uh, cancer cells. So I think that vitamin C is one thing you can't, could add to the program for certain patients, but uh, unfortunately a lot of people uh, lack common sense. You know, Mark Twain said, if common sense is so common, why is it found so uncommonly? So uh, if, if, uh, if people had common sense, you could say, well, don't do this. It, you know, leave this off if you get loose, loose balance. And some of them just don't understand. But uh, the, the, the things that tend to cause the failure of the program, I find that uh, the, the mold of fungus in the house is a very common one. The mercury fillings in their teeth is a very common one. The amount of sugar that they consume is a very common one. You know, so when you're, when you're eating more sugars, you're feeding more critters usually. Uh, the Borrelia loves sugar. Uh, the other co-infections love sugar. And uh, the EMF is a huge issue. You know, so, so, many, so many people have their bed 10 feet away from the electric smart meter on the out, outer wall of their house, and they're frying themselves 24 hours a day if they stay at the house all the time because they're too ill to get out. And uh, you know, so you can't get those people well. But if you can get if you get the smart meter off their house, put an analog meter back on, you know, uh, maybe have them sleep inside of a, a Faraday cage in the meantime, then uh, then you can you make, make some headway. Perfect. Yeah, I have slept in a Faraday cage for over a decade now, and if something were to happen to it, it would be the first thing I would go get another one of, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I think, yeah. it's, uh, I think it's been very, very helpful. So before we get to a couple of wrap-up questions, I just wanted to talk about the mental, emotional health aspects of chronic illness. I know in the past you've been a, a supporter of the Evox tool from the Zyto <laughs> company. I'm curious mm -hmm. if people are interested in exploring the mental, emotional traumas and conflicts and how that may be holding them back from fully recovering. What are some of the tools that you recommend people explore? Well, on the Academy website, uh, that's uh, acimconnect.com, we have several courses on uh, you know, different tools to help address the, the emotions. The emotions that have the greatest impact on the physical body are the subconscious emotions, the ones that we're not consciously aware of. So that makes it a bit challenging to get well. If you're not consciously aware of something, how are you going to figure it out and fix it? And that, that's where tools like uh, Recall Healing comes in. We have, uh, I think, 60 hours worth of teaching on recall healing on there. Recall healing is is because you know what the diagnosis is, you know what the likely conflict is. If you know when the symptoms started, you know what event probably happened that created that conflict, and you can ask the right question to get a, an aha moment. And when you get the aha moment, all of a sudden, physical condition starts resolving. Uh, the uh, the, the EVOX that you mentioned is, is a great tool because it's a, it's a, a, a software where uh, it's hooked to your computer, so when you speak into a microphone, the microphone is not recording your words, but it's recording the frequencies that are embedded in your voice. And after just 15 or 20 seconds of recording, you see displayed on the computer screen all the emotions and all the beliefs that are attached to the person or the event that you were thinking about while you were speaking. And uh, with, with over 95% predictive accuracy in my experience. So, so once you see that on the computer screen, your brain starts trying to process and release those emotions to the best of its ability. But the machine helps it out a little bit because it takes your own voice and converts those into the, the, the voice frequencies into what we call a homeopathic homochord, which is higher frequencies of your own voice beyond the audible range. And then it delivers those frequencies back into your body through a hand cradle, through a hand electrode, while you're listening to pleasant music. And so the pleasant music just distracts the brain so it'll receive the frequencies of your own voice. And the frequencies of your own voice literally shash loose from your cells, the cellular memory, of the emotional traumas, the emotional beliefs that are attached to those traumas from, from 
previous people and previous events. And uh, so we get you know, huge breakthroughs very quickly with that uh, methodology. Uh, you know, some of the other tools that we use are uh, the self-awareness formula, uh, which is uh, uh, another way of asking questions with uh, measuring temperatures on the face. <laughs> pretty, pretty clever way to uh, figure out what the emotions are. Uh, but uh, you know, we're always looking for ways to find find the subconscious emotions and address those. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. So, what do you do to optimize your own health on a daily basis? Ooh, well, I, uh, I I've eaten cleanly since uh, I was 25 years old. I'm 40 years older now, and uh, so I've been eating cleanly more than way over half of my life. Uh, I uh, very rarely eat stuff that I. Uh, would tell my patients to avoid. Uh, I, uh, I drink uh, water throughout the day, not just a big gulp at the beginning of the day, big gulp at the end of the day, but uh, about two ounces. Yeah, about two ounces every every uh, fifteen minutes is my preference. I haven't taken a drink since we've been on this uh, on this uh, program <laughs> here. In my, in my my body saying, "When are you going to get a drink?" <laughs> uh, you know, try, uh, I, I try to do physical activity. Uh, you know, and I find that uh, that you don't want to do. Uh, I call it joint stressful activities like jogging, but uh, but speed walk is a whole lot better choice. Or uh, uh, I, I have a Bowflex in my house that I have hooked up to uh, to oxygen by mask. So I do what we call uh, high intensity interval training with exercise with oxygen therapy at the same time. So that uh, is a way to keep yourself physically fit. And then uh, you know when when uh, when I uh, Get a chance. I, I uh, submit myself to the Evox and to the other, uh, you know, subconscious emotional conflict resolution therapies that I recommend for patients because we all have emotional stuff, no matter who we are and how long we've been at it. Uh, and so that's uh, a good way to, to keep from accumulating physical toxins and microbes in the body, just to, you know, peel off some more emotions. You know, I learned a long time ago when you work on the when, when you have a physical problem and you work on the physical level. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of supplements, a lot of physical work to make a change. And if you stop prematurely, you have a high probability of recurrence. But if you have a physical problem and you work only on an emotional level, it takes a lot less time, a lot less money, a lot less energy, a lot less effort, and a lot lower chance of recurrence if you stop prematurely. But if you work all the way on the spiritual level, then you know you, you get faster results than any of the other, and uh, you know, an even lower chance of recurrence. And a lot of people say. Well, I'm not religious. I say, I'm not asking you to be religious. I'm asking you to be spiritual. That's a big difference. You know, the, the greatest enemy to spirituality is religiosity. I agree. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, so, so spirituality is, is our own personal relationship with the creator of the universe. And, uh, you know, things that block us from our spirituality would be uh, not anger, because that's an emotion, but unforgiveness, which is a spiritual issue. Uh, you know, uh, if, we're, if we're too wrapped up in our, in our pride or ego, then that blocks our connection to the, to the creator because creator that doesn't like I don't think likes uh, people that are too egotistical so so I want yeah, to try to yeah go ahead sorry try we want to try to try to get rid of some of the I call it the spiritual baggage as we go yeah those are some some great things and I I absolutely agree the the mental emotional spiritual work is is an important part of recovering uh, the physical body as well, and in some of Dr. Klinghardt's teaching where he talks about the five levels of healing, that's essentially the, a, a very similar model. So if yeah. people are interested in getting information about the courses that you teach, if they're interested in potentially consulting with you in some way for their own health, how can people do that and what kinds of work are you doing with, with clients or patients these days? Uh, okay. Uh, the, the best way to get uh, further information is to go to the Academy website. Uh, and I would love everybody that's listening to become a free member of the Academy. That's ACIMConnect.com. Uh, ACIM stands for the Academy of Comprehensive Integrative Medicine. And Connect it just means we're connecting uh, patients to the, to the system, uh, you know, patients to doctors, uh, Patients to patients, doctors to doctors, so we're we're the we're the we're in the connecting business, and uh, <clears throat> so you know, on there we have a thousand over a thousand courses. So we uh, we're almost finished uh, recording the uh, the level. Uh, we just finished recording level nine of our ten level 
uh, ACIM Integrated Medicine Fellowship Training Program. And if we finish that, we're going to get back into the more webinars and, uh, and other subspecialty drill down fellowship training programs on specific topics. And uh, so we're always uh, educating folks through that uh, path. Uh, I've, uh, I've been uh, traveling and teaching a lot in various clinics around the country and uh, have uh, I'll probably still do that some, but I have to be cautious that I don't uh, do too much of that because then it takes away from my ability to do more of the, of the uh, you know, the internet teaching and the, and the live conference teaching. You know, I'm going to uh, teach in, uh, in uh, SOPMED, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Colorado Springs meeting here in uh, June. Uh, we'll have our big uh, uh, annual ACIM conference out in Orlando, November 2, 3, and 4 uh, in that uh, our goal is to have at least a thousand people from the general public there. Uh, it's going to be a, a fantastic meeting. We expect to have close to 400 uh, health professionals there. Uh, it's a, a, a three-day meeting. So, for the for the health professionals, it's uh, two choices: you go into either cardiovascular disease or Lyme disease uh, for the first day, and then after that, you go into either neurodegenerative disease or cancer for the next two days. And so we have four four different topics. So surely everybody can find a topic that they find interesting. And, uh, and then for the general public, we're going to have some of the same speakers, but just shorter, shorter pieces of information. And uh, we're going we're to have some people from the general public that have uh, overcome challenging conditions talk also to, to help the people, that, the public that comes there to understand what it's like from a, from a general public perspective. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a lot, yeah. Of, uh, a lot of good information. Anything else that you want to share before we wrap up? Well, I would say this, that uh, so many people that are struggling with Lyme disease and, and a lot of other chronic conditions uh, get to the point of helplessness and hopelessness, and that's a terrible place to be. And a lot of times I find that they get there because of something that a health professional has said to them. Uh, they've said, you know, there is no help, for, help or hope for this condition or whatever they said. Uh, and my statement to them would be, is that person that said that, are they God? Are they the creator of the universe? Do they really know? The answer would be no. You know, they, they put their, if they're a man, they put their pants on one leg at a time just like I do. So they don't really know, you know, whether there's help or hope. They, the correct way for them to, to have said it was, I know of nothing else that can help you. Go search elsewhere. I don't know if anybody uh, that's listening has watched Lorenzo Boyle, but, uh, but that's a great movie to watch because the parents of that child that was suffering continue to search and continue to search, even though the doctor said there is no help or hope. They finally found an answer and saved their child. You know, so so that's that's the that's the message that I think we, we need to be putting out as health practitioners is is giving help and hope to our patients first and foremost. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I want to thank you for spending time with us today and sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. It's hard to believe that I've known you for over a decade now, and uh, you certainly have been a, a mentor of mine and, and helped shape the way that I think about recovering from chronic illness um, and a lot of the work that I try to do as well. So thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it and look forward to connecting with you again in the near future. Yeah, well, I congr congratulate you on the, on the great work that you're doing, uh, both with patients as well as with this uh, education promotion. So I encourage you to keep doing that. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. For more information on today's guest, visit acimconnect.com. That's acimconnect.com. That's the Academy of Comprehensive Integrative Medicine, acimconnect.com. I appreciate your support of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter as Better Health Guy. The show can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. And if you'd like to be added to my newsletter, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. I'm looking forward to many more shows ahead and appreciate your interest. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.